Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us today for this webinar on the interesting topic from research to innovation and enterprise, a case study for graphene. This event is brought to you by the NTU Institute of Advanced Studies, the School of Physical and Mathematical Sciences Graduate Students Club, and the Material Science Engineering Graduate Students Club. My name is Shivam, and I'll be your host for this webinar. As part of the webinar housekeeping rules, please turn off your webcams. All attendees' mics have been muted to prevent any accidental disturbance to the presentation. If you'd like to ask questions during the Q&A session, you can use the raise hand feature at the bottom of your Zoom screen. You can also post your questions in the chat box. Today's webinar is being organized as a part of newly started initiative, Discovery Science Seminars. This is the first webinar under this program. So first of all, I would like to invite Professor Sun Tzu Chien, the newly appointed director of the Institute of Advanced Studies to deliver his welcome remarks. Professor Sam, please. Okay, thank you, Shivam. Uh, welcome everybody to this uh, inaugural this, uh, Discovery Science Seminar. Okay, uh, I'm the new director okay, at IES. So the Discovery Science Seminar uh, is a, a very new uh, seminar series that uh, we want to engage the, uh, the Graduate Students Club so that the Graduate Student Club uh, take the lead role in actually engaging our outstanding NTU professors uh, and try to learn from them. We want, we want to learn from them how our professors, okay, how these professors actually started on their own journey of discovery. And also in the form from hearing the stories from them firsthand, we learn how they actually uh, start from scratch and hopefully this will actually inspire uh, the students, the postdocs, and also the faculty okay, in the NTU community, and also uh, those who are joining us from outside NTU to try to reach for greater heights in science, mathematics, and engineering research. So today, uh, very good, uh, very happy that uh, Professor Sun Tzu Xiang, okay, uh, a very eminent scientist from SPMS, is going to kick off this whole series. So a little bit about uh, Professor Shen, uh, Prof Shen, was my uh, physics professor when I was a student in uh, NUS. So uh, I've known Prof. Shen for many years. And also as an undergraduate student, and later on as a postgrad student, I remember I spent quite a number of, uh, a lot of my time actually uh, going to his labs, collaborating with his students to, to, do, good, to do science. And Prof. Shen is actually one of our, uh, my heroes. Okay, so I'm very greatly inspired by his uh, achievement. So, that was uh, 20 years ago, so you can sort of guess my age. Okay, so uh, I hope that uh, we can learn from Prof Shen, okay, hear his stories from him firsthand, and hopefully we all, all we get very inspired and also get some tips on how to do great science. So I'm still learning from my teacher, okay, today. So without further ado, I'll hand the stage back over to Shiva so that uh, uh, Prof Shen can start his lecture. Thank you. Thank you, Prof Shen. And now let me introduce the speaker for today's webinar, Professor Shen Zixian, who is a global highly cited cross-field researcher by Clarivate Analytics. He has more than 40,000 citations and H index of 101. He has received many accolades during his academic career. He is winner of the NTU Nanyang Award for Research and Innovation. He also received a gold medal for research excellence by the Institute of Physics, Singapore. Professor Shen is the co-director of Center for Disruptive Photonics Technologies at NTU. Without further ado, let's welcome Professor Shen. Uh, I would like to thank the Graduate Club for giving me the opportunity uh, to talk to uh, so many young minds, uh, which make me feel I'm young again. Uh, and uh, congratulations to uh, Professor Sam uh, for taking on this uh, very important uh, position. And uh, now it's his time to move to the uh, uh, young researchers and uh, I'm very sure he will bring uh, IAS into a new height. Uh, so um, I joined the NTO uh, in 2005 well, from uh, NUS and uh, NUS is where I met uh, Professor Sam and uh, later on we all uh, moved to NTO uh, started uh, the School of Physical and Mathematical Sciences and I really witnessed the uh, 
very, very rapid uh, development of uh, higher education research. Uh, in Singapore, I think including uh, NUS and NHEO, and uh, so I'm very glad uh, we all played uh, a small part uh, in the process. So I take a lot of satisfaction for this. Um, it's always a great pleasure to talk to young people and uh, uh, to uh, share the experience, some uh, good ones, some uh, painful ones. And, and uh, so today I will talk about uh, something uh, which I have been engaged in in the past couple of years. Uh, which is doing innovation and we are trying to uh, start a uh, company. Uh, so um, uh, uh, I'm a professor at the School of Physical Mathematical Sciences. I have a joint appointment in material science and engineering. Uh, my research is in close collaboration with the uh, Energy Research uh, Institute uh, in NTU and uh, also I'm supported by Sintra, which is a uh, uh, three-party collaboration between NTU, CNRS in France and uh, Thales in France. So we will talk about the uh, graphene um, and, uh, and, and because my uh, innovation involves graphene and its applications. Now, graphene as a material really has a very, very good uh, properties. And, uh, you know, you don't have to be a material scientist or physicist to understand the uh, uh, good properties of graphene. For example, uh, graphene is very strong. And uh, so in layman's term, it's, uh, you know, uh, 100 or 200 times stronger than steel. It's uh, very light. Uh, it has a low density. And uh, it uh, has uh, excellent uh, thermal conductivity. So uh, it's uh, uh, much better uh, than copper. Copper is already a very, very good uh, thermal conductor. Uh, electric conductivity, uh, it's very interesting. It doesn't follow the uh, Ohm's law. Uh, we all know the Ohm's law and uh, the uh, resistance is proportional to the length of the material. Uh, but um, Graphene uh, doesn't follow this. The resistance uh, mainly come from impurities, come from the edges, from the ends. So basically, if it's a perfect graphene, very, very long, it has no uh, resistance. And uh, as a um, ideal, um, uh, nanomaterial, uh, it has a very large uh, specific surface area uh, and uh, actually because it's uh, only one atomic thick, so uh, it has theoretically it has the uh, largest uh, uh, specific surface area. And uh, actually the uh, uh, properties of graphene can be easily tuned and uh, graphene can withstand the high temperature, it's uh, anti corrosion and, and, and so on. So as a material, graphene has a lot of uh, excellent, uh, some uh, unique properties. Uh, graphene is also uh, important because it's, a, a, it's the model material for other very useful materials. For example, if you have a graphene, which is a one atomic uh, layer of uh, carbon, and uh, if you uh, uh, do a sophisticated uh, uh, cutting, you can build this uh, uh, carbon-60. And if you cut it and roll it up, you get this uh, CNT 
carbon nanotubes. If you stack them together, you get uh, graphite. And uh, also you can uh, stack them together like this, and you have a very uh, complicated, um, but very, very useful uh, 3D, 3D structure. Okay, so this is a combination of uh, graphene and the carbon nanotube. So based on this, uh, graphene can have many uh, very useful applications. And um, for example, graphene uh, can be used for uh, uh, displays, and uh, this will be can, it can replace the ITO, and it's flexible, and it can have uh, very important applications in nanoelectronics and uh, in uh, energy uh, uh, PV and in energy storage, but also because it's only one uh, atomic thick and any items, molecules you put close to it, it will respond. And uh, so it's uh, excellent um, uh, sensor material. Uh, and there are a lot of applications, a lot of people also um, explore the uh, application for uh, hydrogen storage. And uh, lately, uh, people also uh, use a lot of this for um, this uh, uh, flexible electronics, this including the display, uh, the um, uh, energy uh, harvesting and the storage. And because carbon is uh, biocompatible, you can actually uh, explore a lot of the applications uh, in the biomedical areas. So in principle, uh, graphene is really a very, very good material. Now, so uh, these uh, uh, two uh, professors, uh, Gaim and Novoselov, uh, got the Nobel Prize in Physics. Uh, 10 years ago uh, for um, uh, the discovery of uh, graphene. Now, uh, if you look back six years ago and uh, the uh, graphene market and uh, six years from now, uh, and uh, we can uh, project what the market would be, you see there is a lot of uh, uh, changes. So six years ago, uh, basically on um, graphene, everything is about the research, okay? And uh, six years from now, uh, you will see the applications uh, are the uh, dominant and, uh, and the research only constitute a very small part of it. And the projection is um, uh, the composite materials will occupy a huge part of it. And the biggest is the energy storage, uh, uh, batteries and the supercapacitors, and, uh, uh, and the electronics. This is in terms of uh, inks and uh, coatings and so on. Uh, so this will be uh, the one of the, the some of the bigger areas uh, in terms of graphene, and this is uh, another uh, uh, way, uh, another prediction, and, and also you will see the uh, electronics, uh, which is not the nano electronics devices. Okay, uh, occupies uh, a big chunk of it, and energy storage is also a big part of it and uh, uh, composite uh, aerospace uh, and uh, also uh, have a significant share of the market. In terms of uh, dollar terms and the graphene market at the moment is actually not large and uh, this is about uh, 400 million uh, US dollars at the moment. 
and uh, in three years it will be doubled to something like 800 million uh, US dollars. Okay, so it's still smaller than 1 billion. Uh, this is in the US market and uh, if you like, uh, look at the what uh, are the materials, actually I say graphene, graphene actually there are many forms of graphene. Uh, uh, you can have uh, thin films and the thin films are really uh, needed, very high quality films are needed for nanoelectronics and uh, uh, for uh, graphene nanoplatelets, uh, these are strictly speaking, they are not uh, graphene, uh, but uh, people call it a few layer graphene. Uh, and uh, these are most people use for um, energy storage, for the environment, and uh, for uh, uh, composite materials. You can see uh, this actually make up the um, uh, bulk of the application. Okay, uh, and this is uh, dictated by the material development and the quality uh, of the uh, materials and so on. And apart from that, uh, the graphene oxide uh, occupies uh, most of the other applications. So, Graphene nanoplatelets and uh, graphene oxide, you can produce them uh, in large quantities. You can produce them in tons. Uh, there, are, there are other applications, they require uh, thin films, uh, like uh, single layer thin films, okay? Graphene had uh, so many good uh, properties, uh, but uh, why the market is small, okay? And the in terms of dollar value is also small. And uh, uh, since the discovery of uh, graphene in 2004, uh, like more than 15 years uh, have passed. And, uh, and uh, so many researchers, governments spend so much money, effort uh, on graphene uh, and uh, what is the outlook and what is the uh, obstacles or the bottleneck for applications. Uh, so in general, uh, it's very difficult to make a very large area single layer, single crystal film. And this is required for nanoelectronics devices. Um, you know, uh, when, when now we can grow very large silicon single crystals, uh, more or less uh, uh, defect free, but the graphene is far from it, okay? And um, in application for flexible electronics, uh, touch screens, uh, there is no major uh, technical obstacle, uh, but the cost consideration is the major problem. Uh, you really need to uh, compete with some of the uh, very mature techniques like ITO and, and, and so on. And so uh, people will continue to develop, develop uh, new applications and make the uh, uh, graphene application cheaper, more cost effective. And also they want to develop new applications which uh, the existing technologies do not apply. For example, it has to be very flexible and uh, it may be uh, in combination with uh, biomedical uh, and so on. Now, the other type of application which requires uh, not large uh, areas, but uh, large quantity uh, in terms of volume and weight. And uh, the major problem uh, is uh, the 
uh, graphene oxide. Graphene oxide is the most mature uh, technology to make uh, really uh, very good uh, graphene uh, single layer uh, and, and, and so on. So they are very close to single layer. Uh, but the problem is uh, it uses a lot of uh, very strong chemicals, uh, oxidizers, and uh, you can do it in laboratory, but if you really have a mass production, then uh, it cannot uh, pass the environmental assessment. And also by uh, producing graphene oxide, not graphene directly, uh, some of the very good properties I mentioned will be lost. Okay, so it's a very close to single layer, uh, but uh, it doesn't have the good properties in terms of uh, electrical, thermal, and, 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 and so on. And some of the really unique properties uh, are lost. So in terms of uh, graphene research, uh, what people need to do is to to make a uh, good assessment and uh, to see how to proceed. Okay, so one of the uh, application will be uh, using the current uh, technology, current um, current materials, how to find the large scale application of, of graphene. Uh, without the large scale applications, then the you know the the, the favor of uh, graphene uh, will will die very quickly. But also how to make the production of graphene more environmentally friendly, uh, and uh, the best will be you can do it uh, uh, in large scale, but also chemical free. So. Um, I will talk about uh, some of the work we have done uh, in uh, our uh, laboratory. And uh, so uh, we have uh, done some work in, uh, we call it uh, chemical free uh, graphene production. Uh, we actually have uh, two methods. Uh, I will talk about just one of them today. So one of the ways you can produce a really good graphene uh, without using all the uh, strong chemicals is uh, using the uh, uh, a method we call it uh, supercritical uh, method. So in this method, the idea is actually quite simple. So if you have a graphite, Okay, and you can buy graphite uh, as a raw material, and the graphite has a layered structure. Okay, so uh, within uh, each layer is a graphene, uh, and um, so what you need to do is to separate them. Okay, and so one of the ways to do it is uh, you use a high pressure. Uh, and, and to sort of try to press CO2 into the layers, okay, between the layers. And, uh, and if you, the pressure is high enough and the density of the CO2 is actually very, very high, so it looks like a liquid, okay? So you have plenty of CO2 to go into the layers. But it's uh, it also it's uh, very very uh, fluid in the sense the uh, viscosity is still very low, and uh, it acts as a, a gaseous material, and so which makes it easier to uh, to be inserted or we call it interpolated into the uh, graphene layers. And then uh, if you release the uh, pressure uh, very quickly and uh, the uh, gas will expand and uh, produce this uh, fragment of uh, graphene, okay? 
and, and you can uh, uh, in combination with the other techniques to make it even better. So the uh, main uh, principle is you uh, compress the gases between into the uh, graphite between the layers and then you, uh, you release the pressure and uh, it can expand uh, and uh, you, you, by doing this you can produce graphene. So the graphene produced by this way uh, basically you don't have uh, uh, any chemicals and also you, you are not uh, modifying the uh, the material and so the graphene is of high quality uh, but it cannot be very large area so that it's the limitation for some applications but uh, for other applications the uh, this is not a limitation so it's not needed so we have produced uh, some of the uh, graphenes and they are pretty, uh, pretty thin. Uh, they are few layers uh, up to 10, uh, sometimes 20 layers. And uh, uh, in our applications, it's actually not uh, a problem. So uh, this type of materials, uh, including graphene oxide, uh, it's very good for uh, energy storage where you do not really need to use uh, uh, very large area graphene. You don't really need a single layer. Okay. And I will talk about why uh, later. Uh, for the environment, uh, like we have done some very preliminary work on like a painting. Uh, uh, this type of graphene is also good. Okay, so so we have um, uh, graphene, and uh, in principle, we can make it a large scale, uh, and uh, uh, they are chemical, almost uh, chemical free. And what is the next? And the next will be we try to find some applications. So. Uh, we have done applications in supercapacitors. Uh, we have done applications of graphene in uh, lithium ion batteries. Uh, and uh, I will give an uh, example for uh, supercapacitors today. Right. Um, people may not be very familiar with uh, supercapacitors and uh, why do you use supercapacitor? Uh, people are very familiar with the batteries, especially lithium ion batteries, okay? So actually supercapacitors and the lithium ion batteries, uh, the applications are very, very similar. And the properties of a supercapacitor and the lithium ion battery, they are, uh, uh, complementary. So lithium ion batteries uh, uh, deliver a high energy density and the supercapacitor delivers high power density. So supercapacitors can deliver a lot of energy in a very short time and also uh, it can be charged very fast in terms of uh, like seconds and the uh, lifetime of uh, supercapacitor is much uh, larger, much longer than uh, lithium ion batteries. So most of the time they are used together. Okay, when you need uh, a lot of uh, power, then you use supercapacitor. But if you do not need uh, a lot of power, but you want to have a uh, a lot of uh, uh, energy and so you make your device uh, lighter than uh, you use uh, battery, okay? And so this, uh, this uh, diagram uh, people use basically uh, it uh, 
uh, shows uh, the materials of some devices uh, that will very high power density, some other uh, devices that will uh, uh, high energy density and uh, lithium ion battery that will uh, high energy density and uh, uh, supercapacitor or ultra capacitor that will high power density. Okay, so the applications of uh, these two are almost the same. So you can use it for uh, electric uh, vehicles, uh, drones, uh, AI, um, flexible electronics, uh, electronics, consumer electronics, uh, energy harvesting, and uh, power grid uh, stabilizing. This is mainly for supercapacitors because it responds to fluctuation faster. And, and uh, so it's, uh, it, it had uh, both uh, civilian uh, use and uh, military uh, defense uh, usage uh, because uh, a lot of the uh, defense uh, applications need a lot of uh, power in a very short time. Okay, so if we uh, look at it, then what is the um, uh, market? Uh, so the market of a supercapacitor is uh, roughly one tenth uh, of the lithium ion battery. And because the lithium ion, ion battery uh, market is it's very large, so the supercapacitor uh, market is, uh, is also large. Okay, uh, but the lithium ion battery market is very, very competitive, which means the profit is much lower. Uh, I think some uh, actually have no profit. Uh, comparably, supercapacitor uh, has a, a much healthier uh, market environment and the profit is pretty high, it's about uh, 30%, okay? Now, what is the, you know, in market we call it the, the uh, pain point. So what is the shortcoming uh, of this particular technology and how do you uh, resolve this uh, shortcoming? From my presentation, you probably can tell uh, supercapacitor had a lot of uh, advantages over lithium ion battery, but it had a critical uh, shortcoming, which is the uh, energy density. Okay, so the energy density of a supercapacitor is much lower, and so that's limit its uh, applications. Uh, it, it also had uh, other uh, shortcomings which are not critical, uh, which is, uh, for example, they use uh, organic electrolyte and uh, these are intrinsically not very safe and relatively uh, expensive. And uh, supercapacitors uh, typically do not work well at low temperature. Uh, it's slightly better than lithium ion battery, uh, but uh, typically it that, that does not work below uh, 25 Celsius. So, so we uh, started to work on supercapacitors, and uh, we actually had, um, we are lucky to have uh, two uh, fundings. One is from EDB. Uh, we had a uh, uh, funding from EDB. Uh, this is uh, specific for collaboration between Singapore and the Israel. Uh, in principle, these are the, uh, the it, uh, it's applicable to two companies, uh, but in the uh, Singapore side, we allow uh, research institutions to uh, to join and as long as they are working on some uh, applications, not the basic research. 
uh, in applications, uh, people talk about uh, this uh, technology readiness level, okay? And uh, so this is divided into nine levels, uh, from uh, level one to level nine. So level one will be very, very basic uh, research. And uh, level nine is, uh, you know, you have developed a system which is pro proven in the actual working environment. And so, so this is the highest level. Most of our basic research uh, in the very beginning will be TRL level one and uh, level two. And uh, we publish a lot of uh, papers and uh, to demonstrate uh, they have good properties and uh, this will, most of the materials uh, or the publications will be uh, in level one and level two and uh, it's never, never uh, de developed into a higher TRI level. Okay. Uh, so if uh, you find that the material is good, the technology is good, and you may want to develop this toward application, this will include uh, scaling up, and uh, you uh, and uh, you have to consider the uh, other considerations like uh, if the process is uh, uh, scale scalable, it, it uh, can be done in a uh, fast way, and it, if the price, the cost is competitive, competitive, and so on. And so uh, if we do this, we probably can advance in the laboratory, uh, in the uh, university setting, we may be able to uh, divide up this into a level three and a level four. And most of the time, you, uh, uh, after this, you want to uh, do further testing integration, you would like to involve other uh, funding agencies uh, and uh, Singapore is one of the countries put a lot of uh, emphasis on uh, commercialization, innovation, and uh, there's a lot of uh, opportunities uh, to, uh, to get further funding to make, to make it towards a commercial product. And uh, so POC uh, is one of those, uh, and uh, you know, um, EDB and NRF, they also have other schemes, okay? So, so in our research, uh, in our uh, application, we are trying to, uh, starting from uh, like level three, level four, we try to uh, go through this uh, four, five, six, and then if we can demonstrate uh, these uh, devices uh, in a small scale and hopefully at this stage uh, investors may be interested or you may want to set up your own company to further develop and uh, the uh, investors can be uh, uh, interested and uh, they will uh, invest in your company. Okay, so so starting from level uh, like level three, level four to bring it up to some somewhere, uh, level six, level seven will be uh, the one you want to do using some uh, government uh, support. Uh, you know, uh, outside the, the uh, university uh, funding scheme. So, so in our case, uh, but we are developing a material and how do you demonstrate that the material uh, is a problem. So we are not developing a device, a system you can show directly. So we collaborated with the, the Israeli company and the, the Israeli company, they have a production line. 
And uh, so we produce uh, materials in the laboratory setting. And uh, if the results are good, they will uh, reproduce our results or test our results in their laboratory. And if they verify our results, then they will want uh, they want us to uh, have a larger uh, amount. So eventually, they want uh, several kilograms, and they can use their real their real production line to test and verify our material. Okay, so uh, so this is the collaboration model we have. We produce the materials and we scale, scale up the materials and they do the verification. Eventually, they will use their production line to certify our material. Okay, and because we uh, NTO developed all the materials and the uh, uh, IP for the uh, material development, uh, resides in Antio. Okay, so we tested uh, several materials with uh, the Israeli company, uh, it's, uh, it's Elbit. And uh, Elbit is a uh, company which uh, works on both uh, uh, civilian and, uh, and defense products. Uh, it's a, a very large company in Israel. It's uh, it's listed in the uh, uh, Nasdaq um, in the U.S. Uh, and uh, so we have been collaborating with them for about six years. Uh, the last three years we we have official collaboration uh, because we had the uh, uh, funding from both governments. But before that, we already collaborated for, for a considerable time. So we de developed the several materials and uh, so this is their own uh, material. And uh, uh, we, we developed these uh, two materials. Uh, one of these uh, uh, involves uh, graphene and uh, this is our most um, uh stable material which uh, which we, we we think can be commercialized uh the other material uh which uh, still needs some uh fine tuning some improvement uh so this improvement is actually how to fit into their current uh, super capacitor technology and uh, if you want them to change their technology, change their processes, sometimes it's very hard. So uh, that's the reason a lot of the laboratory materials never make it to the, uh, into commercial material. Uh, it's because the way we make it, and it, it cannot be, some cannot be scaled up, uh, some which is just not suitable for the real process technology. Okay, so uh, they are, you know, making the uh, devices uh, in, the, in their real production line using the existing technology is actually critical for, uh, for us for the purpose of commercialization. And you can see uh, our performance uh, is about uh, two and a half times of the uh, their, their current uh, material. Okay, so so our key technology will be two part. Uh, uh, it's one is like uh, graphene uh, production and the graphene production we have more. Uh, mainly uh, for scalable methods, we have a tool method, like the chemical method, uh, which is more mature, but uh, environmentally not friendly. And also we have this uh, supercritical carbon dioxide method. This is a physical method, and this is a, a very 
uh, put my shirt to produce uh, chemical free graphene. Uh, we also have um, uh, ha uh, have done the uh, application. Uh, I will not talk about the, to how to make the uh, graphene into this uh, supercapacitor materials. They see the composite material, so it's not uh, uh, purely graphene. But the graphene plays a very important role. Okay, and uh, graphene, the good properties of graphene actually are all utilized. And uh, so for supercapacitor or lithium ion battery applications, all the bad, uh, uh, like a bottleneck uh, for graphene, all avoid, avoid it. So for example, uh, the good properties of graphene is very strong, very conductive, thermally, electrically, uh, very high surface area, is very uh, anti corrosion They have always been uh, used in uh, supercapacitors because when we make it into a uh, composite material, we, we want to use all these properties. They have to be con conductive electrically. They have to be able to dissipate the heat very quickly and they have to be very strong mechanically so the material can last a very long time and uh, it has to be uh, anti-corrosive because the uh, some of the electrolyte especially if you use organic material it, uh, it's uh, uh, very corrosive and, and uh, we don't really need a single layer uh, we don't really need a very large area uh, actually, a large area is not an advantage for us. Okay, so so the applications of uh, graphene uh, in energy storage, uh, in uh, environment, uh, actually you don't really need a uh, large sample, uh, large area. Okay, and, and this is the quick comparison between our product and the uh, the product in the uh, uh, market and the Maxwell is by far the largest uh, uh, supercapacitor manufacturer and the last year he was, uh, Maxwell was um, uh, bought by Tesla uh, so uh, Tesla sees a very important role of supercapacitor okay. and, and you can see our energy density is uh, very high our uh, power density, we could not measure the upper limit because the limitation of our uh, laboratory. And the uh, working temperature is uh, very low and it can work at the minus 60 degrees. And this is very important because uh, in a lot of these uh, defense applications and, and uh, aerospace applications, uh, you need uh, minus uh, at least uh, 50 or 60 Celsius. Uh, if you take an airplane and if you look, uh, monitor the, um, uh, the, the uh, outside temperature, typically the, uh, at uh, 10,000 meters above the, uh, uh, above the Earth, the, uh, the temperature is minus 50 degrees. Okay, so uh, so so being uh, able to operate at minus sixty degrees is very important. Uh, and you know, Elon Musk is uh, putting up all these um, uh, mini satellites uh, in this Starlink uh, program. And uh, so so well, those operations, the uh, energy storage devices will need the low temperature. Okay, so uh, very quickly I will uh, wrap up. Uh, we have, uh, at the moment, we have uh, demonstrated the uh, pre-commercial level material production. And, uh, and uh, we have demonstrated the prototype cells. And uh, we actually just started a company not long ago. And we are in the process of uh, talking to potential investors.
Okay. Uh, so we have very, uh, uh, we are lucky to have uh, uh, some, uh, some of the best uh, collaborators. Uh, so we have uh, uh, LB uh, systems uh, in this uh, particular collaboration where I, I talked about today. We also have uh, Thales uh, from France uh, to collaborate with us. We have also some Chinese companies we are talking to. Uh, we also have um, a collaboration with uh, Johnson Massey uh, on lithium ion batteries, which I didn't talk about. So these uh, commercial organizations, these companies uh, really gave us uh, a, a lot of uh, very, very useful feedback and the collaboration with them really uh, enriched our uh, experience uh, and, and uh, we also now we understand uh, the angle they are looking at. It, it can be very different from the rich researchers' point of view. Okay, uh, so we talk. Uh, so we have scaled up our uh, our product, and we have demonstrated the factorability, and also uh, the cost. Okay, because uh, everybody think about uh, uh, graphene, it's very, very expensive. And uh, it is very expensive at the moment because of two reasons. Uh, one is the environmental cost, and the other one mainly is there's no large scale application. And uh, so, you know, there are a lot of actually capabilities to produce graphene but uh, there's no buyer. And if there's no buyer, you, you, people only buy in terms of grams, milligrams. So this reason it's, uh, it's expensive. Uh, but in principle, uh, because the raw material uh, for uh, the mass production is mainly uh, graphite and uh, other uh, very cheap materials. So in principle, uh, the cost of the graphene do not have to be high. And uh, we have demonstrated actually it, it, it is not high. Uh, so the cost of our material uh, in terms of uh, tons, kilograms, it's slightly higher than other materials. But really what the, the relevant calculation is for certain capacity, you know, you you want to buy the material not in terms of weight, you want to buy the material for certain capacity or energy density. So if uh, in terms of energy density, actually our material is much lower. Okay, it's about half of the price uh, of other materials. And, and uh, so, so they see the, uh, there is a uh, real commercial uh, opportunity here. So, so I will stop here and, and uh, I would uh, like to uh, entertain some questions. Uh, so, so basically we are trying to uh, uh, address the uh, pain point in the uh, applications in the market. Okay, and, and uh, so, so we found some of the solutions. So this open up the uh, uh, opportunities for us. And uh, we have, uh, in the process, we have uh, actually uh, de developed some uh, innovative ways of doing things. And we have some uh, NTO uh, IPs. Uh, and uh, we have uh, started a company. Uh, we have uh, licensed the uh, IPs from NTO. And uh, we are in the process of uh, uh, setting up our operation in Singapore. Uh, so my own experience is uh, it's uh, a lot of hard work, and uh, this is very much uh, like research. You you do more and more, then you it looks you are coming back to the beginning, uh, and, and then in research you do the same. Also you spend a lot of time doing more research and you come back saying, wow, it's all failure. On the other hand, the thinking 
the requirement of uh, commercialization, talk to investors, and you really need to know what they are thinking, what they want to know, not uh, talk too much about your innovation. You need to talk about the market, your, uh, your, your, your uh, product, and how to make money for them. Uh, so this is a very steep uh, learning process. Uh, I, 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 I think I should have started a long time ago, uh, but you guys are young, and uh, I think uh, Singapore is really in a very good environment. Uh, government is pushing very, very hard. So we have this uh, RIE 2020, now we are starting 2025. And, and uh, so I think you, you are in the right time, in the right place and the right age, okay, to start something. Uh, so I will stop here and, and uh, I can uh, entertain some questions. Thank you, Prof. Thank, Shen, you the, thank you, Prof. Shen, for the informative session. Before mo moving to Q&A session, I would like our co-host, Ernest, to ask a few questions from Prof. Shen regarding graphene discovery. Ernest, please. Hi. Okay, thank you, Shivam. All right, so Prof. Shen, so we got a few questions on the discovery of graphene. So uh, once again, thank you for the insight for the, uh, for the talk. So one of the question is that since uh, ever since graphene was uh, discovered in a sense of being uh, easily commercialized by the physics Nobel laureates, so a lot of researchers have actually jumped onto this uh, material. So there's a lot of research that's been uh, ongoing to understand the behavior of graphene in uh, various applications. But uh, well, maybe have a, can you share your thoughts on what would be the next great discovery related to graphene? Yeah. Right. Um, I, I didn't catch your last uh, sentence. Uh, oh, yeah. So it's like, uh, what would be this uh, great discovery? So like, uh, what kind of, uh, uh, like what aspect of graphene do you think would be the next, uh, uh, so called a big, uh, uh, how say, a big uh, technological shock to the probably to the industry? So probably right. I think uh, you've covered quite a few portions and quite a lot of uh, uh, gaps for graphene. So what do you think will be the next uh yeah this uh, discovery that will propel graphene to maybe uh, to a better applications for the commercial side yeah right um right uh, so so this is a very good question um uh so in the very early on we had actually our group had a lot of uh, collaboration with uh, these uh, two novel laureates. And because I'm a physicist and they are physicists and uh, physicists naturally will explore uh, the uh, nanoelectronics uh, in applications in uh, optical uh, devices and so on. So electronics and optical properties are easier for us. Uh, so, so we had some joint publications and so on. And uh, later on, uh, they, I mean, of course, they did a lot of things. Uh, I, I was reviewer for some of their research grants and they were doing conductive ink, which yeah, I think they also realized that making single crystal uh, graphene single layer, uh, it's uh, difficult, it's a long-term goal. Okay, a, a lot of people are still working on, on, on this and they made a lot of uh, progress. Uh, I know Prof, Professor Rolf, uh, he's a brilliant uh, carbon scientist, he's uh, making a lot of push on this. But, uh, but people, I think in the short term, you know, within the next five years, uh, most of people are trying to utilize uh, the graphene or the graphene nanoplatelets or, or uh, graphene oxide uh, and, and these are more applicable to like uh, conductive ink which are the nanoplatelets uh, which we are also working on uh, and, and also uh, uh, energy storage uh, which I uh, uh, illustrated. Uh, another big area will be in the environment uh, because uh, uh, 
uh, all the properties, if you think about uh, for environment applications, for example, for paint, okay? For paint for the uh, shipping industry. And the graphene can absorb uh, UV light. It can, is very anti-corrosive and it's anti, actually antibacterial growth uh, and, 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 and so on. So, and, and uh, the conductive nature is, uh, is able to dissipate heat. These are all critical advantages, critical properties for this uh, paint industry. Uh, we did some work, but uh, we, we decided to concentrate on, uh, on energy storage. So I think these are the areas, energy storage, uh, environment, uh, and uh, some uh, electro, uh, electronics uh, are, are still the main areas in the next five years. And this is illustrated by one of the, uh, uh, the, the PPT slides uh, of the, how, how people view the different types of uh, graphene uh, the, the market and, and so, yeah. Thank you, Paul. All right, uh, thank you, Shen. Okay, so actually I have also another question. So earlier during your presentation, you covered about the technological readiness level. So given that like, for materials like graphene, it has been discovered there's a lot of hype on it because there's so many advantages. And there's also the fact that we have to balance between uh, uh, understanding uh, this material in a scientific point of view and also trying to commercialize it. So can we have your opinion on which one would be better? I mean, like, uh, like which, how, how the emphasis uh, should be more towards uh, commercializing it as soon as possible for the betterment of mankind? Or should we first focus on the scientific understanding before we jump into the commercialization? Right. Um, right. Uh, this is a critical question also. Um, from... Material point of view, uh, people always say uh, this is not uh, only limited to graphene, it's uh, any material which in principle has a lot of uh, good uh, properties. Uh, so the initial uh, like four or five uh, years will be for the basic understanding of the properties and to demonstrate in the laboratory scale, it can have a lot of applications. And, uh, but the people say, you know, like uh, when, when you talk about the, like uh, after 10 years, then you must have some sizable application. Uh, if not, then the interest in this particular area will decrease, okay, because all the basic uh, applications, uh, basic uh, research, the basic understanding have been done, and uh, it becomes much harder to, to, to generate the new knowledge, and uh, so people have to go for big scale application. And uh, so the, the uh, interest will, co will come down until a new application or, or large scale applications uh, are realized, then the interest will always uh, uh, will go up again. So you always this curve initially, it's very, very fast and you reach a peak and then it decreases and waiting for the next peak to come up. This will be the, uh, the, the, the application. Yeah, I, I think uh, graphene because it has so many possible applications and, and uh, so the research is still continuing. Uh, it's because this material is really very unique. Yeah. All right. Okay, so Fauxshan, uh, just one last question. So given that you have uh, done a quite a few collaboration with trying to commercialize uh, graphene and also uh, try to upscale the graphene, so can you have your opinion on what are the future use of graphene in commercial products and how the process of uh, trying to upscale this uh, graphene with uh, the industry? Yeah. So what's your experience like and any tips that you can share with uh, probably the researchers over here? 
Yeah. Right. I, 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 my own assessment will be still I need the storage. And uh, if you from the chart, you see a lot of uh, composite materials, uh, which uh, our uh, super capacity material is actually a composite material. It involves graphene, but also uh, other materials. I think uh, uh, apart from I need your storage uh, uh, and the environment, I think uh, flex flexible electronics will be the next um, large scale application because uh, some of the traditional materials cannot be made flexible or, 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 or foldable, bendable. And the carbon is intrinsically uh, biocompatible. So, so I think they, they, this area can be very, very interesting. And uh, because this uh, wearable electronics, uh, flexible electronics, can have a lot of applications in uh, health, health monitoring, and, 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 and so on. And uh, so we need um, batteries, uh, we need uh, uh, supercapacitors, uh, so that the, uh, the energy sources, which are also flexible. So, so I think this is, is a big area. Uh, sensing can be a uh, uh, readily applied, uh, but I'm not too sure uh, what is the market. Sensing in principle is a big market, uh, but I'm not too sure how the uh, graphene com sensors compare to the other sensors. I think eventually we, we are all looking for this uh, nano electronics, uh, but it will take some time. Okay, okay. all right, thanks, Prof. All right, so now I'll just hand back to Shivam who will carry on with the QA session for the audience. All right. Okay, okay. Thank, thank you. Thank, thank you, you uh, Now let us move on to the QA session. So if you'd like to ask question, you can use the raise hand feature on the bottom of your Zoom screen. When you are called on to ask your question, please unmute yourself and ask your question. In case you experience any difficulties, you can also send your questions in chat. A few participants already sent their questions during the registration itself. So let us take those questions first. First question from Michael is, how does the future prospect of photonic material looks like? What is the major obstacle hindering photonic devices to enter into market and compete with electronic devices? Right. Uh, I think again, this is um, everybody is looking for, is waiting for the big uh, application, and, uh, and 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 I think uh, mainly we have to look at the shortcomings of uh, graphene, and uh, so the shortcomings are it's not easy to make. Uh, so-called high quality graphene for, for you know, uh, nano electronics applications. Uh, but for electronics, uh, I think the broadly speaking, the conductive ink and, and, and so on, these come under electronics. Uh, I think everybody now uh, seems to agree, uh, I need the storage will be the the near near term application, uh, and uh, I I think it's also very important uh, to uh, to be able to manufacture graphene with a good quality but um, uh, environmental friendly because we we do talk to uh, a lot of government agencies uh, they they take this. Uh, production very seriously and uh, everywhere, not only in Singapore, you have to uh, pass this uh, environmental assessment. The current uh, graphene oxide uh, simply cannot pass the, uh, the, the, the assessment. So that, that is the problem. 
Kenneth wants to ask, how does graphene advance energy storage? Are the advancements efficiency based or is it towards cost and production improvements? Right, I think in the digital age, uh, sensing uh, this uh, flexible electronics, uh, wearable uh, and affordable and band uh, 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 electron uh, 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 energy sources, these are all very critical. And, and I think in this area, uh, graphene can really play a, a, a part. Uh, some you really need, uh, you know, very big uh, uh, power, but a lot of these applications you, you do not really need the very high power. And uh, in principle, a lot of this uh, graphene can be used for uh, like uh, uh, PV for power generation as well. So I integrated the power generation, power uh, energy storage uh, can be done relatively easily uh, in, in graphene uh, and it can be easily uh, integrated with uh, this, um, you know, uh, uh, flexible electronics, uh, medical uh, yields. So, so they, I, I, I have no doubt that it will, uh, will, will be very important, uh, uh, you know, it, it will play a very important role in this uh, internet of things and, and, and so on. Yep, us. How good is graphene in fuel cell application? So sorry, I didn't catch. How good is graphene in fuel cell application? How the graphene is good in fuel cell application? Um, yeah, sorry, I didn't catch it uh, yet. So I'll repeat my question. How good is graphene in Fuel cell application. Right. Um, I'm not too sure. Uh, so, so I think the graphene at the moment, the the application is not large. Uh, so, so I think uh, um, we 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 really need to uh, because I I have not really work on other materials uh, or, or study the market. So in, if you really want to have an application, uh, you have good property, it's the, the, the beginning. And you really have to, uh, when you set up company, when you talk to investors, you, then you know they don't care. <laughs> They, the, what they care about is what is the market, what is your, your, your market share, and how do you make sure you can protect your market, and how they can make money. These are all not wrong, yeah. uh, and, and, and I think we need to learn to, to talk to them, and you have to study the market. And, and, and so one last question uh, from the registration phase is by Kushan. His question is, how graphene can be used for future demand with technological developments? Can graphene be artificially created? Uh, right. Um, graphene can be art artificially created. Um, I, I didn't talk about uh, how to grow graphene uh, because uh, my angle is starting from graphite how to uh, uh, like like uh, by using different method how, how to create the graphene from graphite uh, but the, for growing films uh, they are not from graphite uh, they typically they, they use the CBD uh, chemical vapor deposition you use different uh, uh, gases uh, sources to to grow uh, this uh, graphene. 
So this is the chemical uh, gases, chemical uh, uh, mindset. Um, and um, uh, again, I think uh, the uh, for this part, the really it can have a lot of in principle. It can have a lot of uh, very important applications. Uh, it can replace some of these uh, silicon uh, uh, devices because now you know all this uh, technology evolution is based on silicon. So anything to do with silicon, silicon technology, if your material, your technology is compatible, it's good. If it's not compatible with uh, silicon technology, it's not good. So before graphene, actually people are very, very interested in carbon nanotube. Uh, a lot of the good materials, good uh, properties, I described for uh, gra graphene. Actually, they are applicable to carbon nanotube as well. Because, uh, well, you can simply uh, look at the carbon nanotube, it's folded graphene. Okay. And uh, so people were very excited about the uh, carbon nanotube, uh, but people realized this is very difficult to make it compatible uh, with the silicon technology. It's uh, in uh, silicon devices, the, the devices are made into layer structure, but the CNT is like a grass. It's, uh, it grows differently. So, so this reason people are, uh, are interested in now interested in graphene because in principle is compatible with uh, with layered structure of uh, of silicon. But uh, how to grow really really good quality very large area uh, graphene is is a real challenge. Thank you, Prof. Shen. Now let's take the questions from audience. So they can either use the raise hand feature or they can post the questions in chat box. So first question in the chat box is from Jovan Lim. Uh, he wants to know uh, that uh, he says that I understand graphene research is still relatively young. What are your views on the recycling of materials containing graphene? Right. Okay, um, thank you very much for this uh, question. Uh, right, this is precisely one of the uh, research directions. Okay, and uh, how to people talk about the circular economy. So, so basically, uh, you know, my uh, I, I will produce something and uh, then there will be some byproduct, but uh, the waste from my uh, process could be something very useful for you. Uh, so one of the uh, project we are doing now is uh, to collaborate with uh, other people and uh, uh, to, uh, to use not only graphene, uh, sometimes people produce uh, graphene, but uh, some uh, could be carbon nanotube, could be uh, amorphous carbon because it's not really uh, a, a, a process they optimized for, uh, uh, for graphene growth. And uh, they produce uh, different types of carbon, different forms of carbon, and we use it for uh, our su supercapacitor. So sometimes they, they so for example, we have collaborators, they want to uh, produce hydrogen. And uh, they produce hydrogen by using a uh, uh, catalyst and, 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 and so on. And, uh, at byproduct, they have a lot of carbon uh, material. Uh, so some all forms of uh, carbon and we want to work uh, with them to see if they can be uh, can, can, can be good for supercapacitors. Uh, 
uh, and uh, some of them are very good. Uh, but for, for our case, uh, if it's uh, like we produce uh, graphene using chemical method, then we'll try to try to uh, utilize uh, what, whatever they got. Uh, it uses a lot of uh, very strong chemicals and how the strong chemicals can be used for other applications. So people actually use a lot of this uh, uh, this uh, uh, a, a group of applications together to hopefully to produce zero or zero waste eventually. Uh, but our primary uh, research direction is how to produce graphene with no waste on its own. So it's more clean and the better we, we can do everything ourselves. But, but this is a very, very important uh, direction. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Chris from MA uh, wants to know how uh, to extend the use of graphene in NTU and how NTU leads on that. Uh, sorry, this is how to use graphene. How to extend the use uh, use of graphene in NTU? NTU. Yeah. Uh, right. I, I mean, in principle, university is uh, not really uh, for commercialization. But uh, NTU has a very, very strong uh, team or teams uh, working on graphene. Actually, uh, uh, Singapore is one of the major countries produced a lot of uh, very high impact uh, research uh, on graphene. So we are really on the world market for research uh, on graphene. Uh, this is uh, starting very early on. Uh, NTU uh, is doing, it's really doing a lot and, 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 and NUS is also doing very well. So, so we, we really contributed to the, at least the, the research community, we are really well known. Uh, I think now uh, NTU, uh, you know, following the government directive of uh, uh, this RIE research innovation enterprise, we are putting a lot of effort into commercializing uh, uh, research uh, uh, results. And uh, so people, a lot of people are working on uh, like uh, graphene, uh, graphene related research. And uh, some people are going for this commercialization and some use uh, graphene for their own uh, commercialization activities. And, and so, so, so NTO is actually having a good reputation for, 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 for trying to commercialize uh, our research. Next question by Alok Ranjan is, when we should expect industry academia coming together to push flexible electronics? What are the opportunities in this direction here in Singapore? Is the wave already here or are we waiting for some breakthrough? Right. Uh, I'm not the best person to answer this, uh, but uh, NTO again, it, uh, we, 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 we do uh, spend uh, uh, a, a lot of uh, uh, resources on flexible electronics. I think uh, um, material science, uh, Professor Chen Xiaodong is uh, heading a uh, center, a, 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 a initiative uh, working on flexible electronics. And uh, I have recently uh, participated in the webinar with, uh, by a uh, uh, Stanford professor a uh, very famous uh, uh, Chen and, and she has been collaborating with NTO for a long time, A-STAR. 
also had a lot of people working on this. Uh, so so uh, I only have a small presence uh, in terms of uh, energy storage for uh, flexible electronics uh, devices, uh, but but uh, until uh, and uh, in Singapore in general, we are spending a lot of effort. I, I think uh, they are actively looking for uh, participation from the uh, industry. Yeah, I, I, I'm very hopeful that they, they, this is a really an area which we, we can make a, a real impact. Michael wants to ask the problems uh, on manufacturing graphene, uh, problems while manufacturing graphene except uh, the fact that uh, he already knows that graphene is impeding factor from reaching to the market. So are there any other problems when manufacturing graphene or upon manufacturing it? Mm, I, I think um, the, uh, the cost of uh, manufacturing large quantity graphene is one of the problems. Uh, it's not the only problem uh, how to uh, make uh, the product, uh, I think, uh, compatible and, uh, and, and the competitive with existing technology is also the, the problem. Uh, I think, uh, for example, we, we, we did some work uh, 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 on painting, on paint for uh, shaping, and uh, so, so we tested some materials. But you know, for painting, uh, in uh, for shaping, they actually the time needed is at least uh, six years, because if you develop a paint, you go through all the different tests, and they have to. Uh, for, for to become a, 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 a real paint, you actually have to uh, test it in a real shaping for three years and, and so on, so on. So this is very, very vigorous. So this is almost like a development of a drug. Um, so, so I think um, the application it all, always takes time, and, and I think uh, it takes a long time. Sometimes, I think it also shows the industry are very cautious. Uh, they are all very responsible. So, so I think this is uh, now uh, everything has to go through the due process, and uh, so it takes longer. But uh, but uh, I, I think the industry really wants to ensure everything is it's done properly before it goes to a large scale application. Mohammed Amen has a nearly similar question. Why uh, graphene is not used in large scale? Is it the cost or availability to prepare? So I guess you have already commented on the car. Yeah, cost. yeah I, th I think it, yeah, it's a cost and how to make it competitive. Uh, yeah. So, I guess uh, these are all the questions we had from the audience. So any other questions? Um, if not, uh, let's once again thank Professor Shen for taking time off amid uh, his busy schedule. And thank you all for your wonderful participation in this event. Before you leave the webinar, do scan the QR code for the survey and attendance form. We value your feedback to help us improve future webinars. Meanwhile, stay well and stay healthy. Thank you. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk to our young minds. Yeah, I think be brave and try different things. Uh, I think Singapore is really the right, the right place uh, to do this and the government gave a lot of uh, encouragement and uh, Take care. Thank you.